First on Fox at 5 tonight, St. Charles County residents on edge this morning, maybe when the warning siren went off accidentally. Meteorologist Jamie Travers explains what happened today, Jamie. Yes, the siren sounded this morning at around 950 uh, and that was in St. Charles County. So Captain Chris Hunt, the emergency management director for St. Charles County, says that they were conducting a training exercise and as a part of that training exercise, they were supposed to silent test the outdoor warning siren system. Unfortunately, we made a mistake and the system read a button that we pushed and uh, sent an audible signal. Uh, out to the public as opposed to a silent signal back to us. So the result of that was that uh, the sirens went off in St. Charles County. They conduct an audible test once a month, but they also do a silent test weekly. The mistake left them fielding a lot of calls from concerned citizens. Intentions in the world are pretty high. I think people were not expecting the sirens to go off. I know they were expecting the sirens to go off. We typically put out a message on our social media on test days. Uh, to remind folks that it's just a test. We didn't do that today and it caught people off guard. Okay. Captain Hunt says they spend a lot of time educating their residents on the importance of these warning sirens and he wants the public to know they are still reliable. It's something that we feel is very important and when these things happen, it's unfortunate, it's a mistake that happened. Uh, but I want to encourage people, you can still trust the warning siren system. Uh, when unfavorable weather conditions are moving into the county. We're monitoring weather and folks need to adhere to the sirens when they're activated. This is a rare occurrence. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. You read articles from around the country and sometimes it does happen. Just unfortunately it happened here today in St. Charles County. And as a reminder, the sirens are tested the first Monday of each month. And in St. Charles County, the sirens run full strength for three minutes to make sure the amplifiers and batteries maintain proper power during the full cycle. Today, those sirens only sounded for less than a minute. Reporting live in O'Fallon, meteorologist Jamie Travers, Fox 2 News. And a live look tonight from our renewal by Anderson web camera outside at Aries Resort in Grafton, a little cooler. A little cooler, <laughs> but another beautiful day. Yeah, you could feel the difference. Let's get a check the forecast with the meteorologist Chris Higgins. The sun was nice, but different. Be honest, though. If mm. yesterday hadn't happened, you'd have been ecstatic about it. Sure, I was. absolutely. But oh. yesterday it was 82. Yeah, so <laughs> it was not 82. It was not 82 today. Yes, it does make a difference. Everything is relative. Those temperatures are a whole lot cooler, but relative to normal, they're pretty close to what they should be. Now, the little thing about the sirens, if in doubt, just go take shelter and then seek information. It only takes about 30 seconds to figure out if there is anything going on. So hopefully that will help you out in the future. Hopefully it doesn't happen again. Right now we're at 48 degrees. How big of a change has it been? 33 degrees colder over the last 24 hours. Yesterday at this time, it was 81 after a high of 82 degrees. We will not see the 80s again tomorrow, but we do have warmer temperatures in that forecast. Right now we're seeing cooler air move in from the north and east. Some low 40s, Litchfield's at 41, 46 over in Greenville. But you get further and further to the south, Bunker's at 67. So the warm air is not that far to the south and southwest, and neither is the cold front. It's only made it into the southern Ozarks, and with time late this evening, overnight tonight, turns into a warm front, starts to lift back to the north, so warmer temperatures will roll in for tomorrow, but not this evening. If you're going to be out and about, maybe trying to grab a late night bite to eat or a late night or late evening walk, you'll want a jacket for sure. We'll be down into the upper 30s uh, shortly after 10 o'clock and in the low 30s by early tomorrow morning. The warming trend does begin tomorrow, but the chances for rain will be increasing as we work towards the weekend. I'll tell you how much dry time to expect coming up in a few minutes. Well, the director for Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the CDC, says the agency is prepared for yet another COVID variant or pandemic. Now, she made that comment during a visit to St. Louis today. Fox 2 medical reporter Dan Gray has the story. Dr. Walensky toured the CARE STL Health Center, a federally qualified center that turns no one away. She was escorted by St. Louis City Health Director, Dr. Monty Schlotzweo Davis. They visited several departments, including triage, the pharmacy, women's health, pediatrics. The clinic has been instrumental in offering COVID testing and vaccines in North St. Louis. Dr. Walensky says the vaccines gave everyone hope, 
but we may have been too optimistic at the time they came on the scene. We didn't talk about the word waning. We didn't talk about the word new variants. Um, and we have been given some curveballs. Um, so we will um, now be a bit more cautious about our optimism, but also recognize that these vaccines provide extraordinary protection. Dr. Walensky says the CDC will soon consider lifting the mask mandates on airplanes, but she's confident the agency will have the tools necessary to deal with another COVID variant or pandemic. We need to be vigilant and to um, watch for any new variants. We at the CDC have scaled up so many of our efforts in surveillance, including our wastewater surveillance. But we do know that we have so many tools that we can use to prevent um, severe disease. And in that context, we really do want to give people uh, a break in their mask wearing when things are good um, and say, keep those masks close by just in case we need them again. The mask mandate in St. Louis City will expire at midnight Sunday. The city health director, though, strongly encourages mask wearing in indoor settings. Now, I'm very clear in saying that I strongly recommend people continue to mask indoors, especially when at high risk, meaning for our elderly population, people in congregate living settings and those who are immunocompromised or have high risk disease settings, they still should. And when asked how she would convince the millions of Americans who are against the vaccine, Dr. Lewinsky, Dr. Lewinsky said that we need to listen and continue to have several conversations with that group. The mask order in St. Louis City is expiring Sunday and it will not be renewed. The St. Louis Department of Health will continue to recommend masks in public places for those with pre-existing conditions and children who are not eligible for vaccines and boosters. Illinois and St. Louis County ended their mask orders Monday. The health department is continuing to monitor key metrics and will adapt policy changes as needed. Well, healthcare workers at SSM St. Louis University Hospital are fighting for better pay. Contract negotiations began between the union that represents them and the healthcare and St. Louis University Hospital. That began in September. Now, according to a union spokesperson, SLU management is now offering a 1.1% raise, which is about 17 cents for the average employee. Workers say that doesn't fulfill the respect they deserve after working the front lines during the pandemic. We've been through two COVID variants, still no contract. And our managers refuse to, to come up with the money that we just so deserve. My work family at SLU, hey. <laughs> and many others in healthcare systems throughout St. Louis uh, have battled COVID for over two years. And it's been, it's just been a long, tiresome ordeal. Now management at SSM Health say their goal is an agreement that rewards employees for their hard work and ensures continued exceptional care and that SSM does remain committed to reaching a mutually beneficial agreement. Well, tonight, the Baldwin Police Department is mourning the loss of a beloved officer who suddenly died at his home. And his co-workers say Officer Steve Morrison was kind and humble. Fox News' Kelly Hoskins joins us live from the Baldwin Police Department with how Officer Morrison is being remembered. Kelly. Well, the Indian Vic Officer Steve Morrison Police Cruiser is draped with black bunting here outside of the police department as officers continue to grieve his death. They say he will be remembered as an officer with a big heart and a pillar in the community. On Thursday, black bunting was draped over the Baldwin Police Department to honor Officer Steve Morrison. Sergeant Rob Rogers says he had the pleasure of having Officer Morrison as his field training officer and says he will be missed. What I got from him was the ability to communicate with people um, no matter what the situation involved. He had a really, really a good knack for being able to speak to people. Officer Morrison's police cruiser that he was assigned to drive sits in front of the police department as a reminder of an officer who dedicated his life to protect and serve. He passed away at his home on his day off and dedicated the last 35 years of his life to service in the Baldwin community. The officer known for having a great sense of humor wore a lot of hats at the department. He was a D.A.R.E. officer visiting a lot of elementary schools, a bike patrol officer, and assisted with community affairs dealing with neighborhood policing. Steve had an incredible sense of humor. Um, and with him training, field training, so many officers that he did throughout his career, 
that legacy has been passed on to officers like myself. With flags at half staff, officers say hearts are very heavy about losing someone who gave so much to the community. It hit us hard. As a, a police officer, we deal with tragedy a lot, but it really hits home when it's one of our own. We'll rally together and, and we'll move forward from this too. Now, funeral arrangements are still pending for Officer Morrison and the officers here at the Baldwin Police Department say they are just proud to know that he had a big impact on the community. Reporting live from Baldwin, Kelly Hoskins, Fox 2 News. Well, drivers are having to make some serious financial sacrifices just to stay on the road. Why the price of gas could be rising to record breaking levels with no signs of stopping. State leaders are urging retailers to remove any Russian products from their store. I'll tell you what else is happening here in Jefferson City to show Missouri is not supporting Russia. Is this warm weather giving you the urge to garden? The Butterfly House tells us when you can start attracting pollinators. Check out this live look, courtesy of EarthCam, inside the Botanical Garden in Naples, Florida. Wow, that looks nice. We just go there in our mind. We had some Florida-like temperatures this week, but our gardens aren't quite ready for vibrant colors and blooming flowers like this one. And if you've had the urge to tend to your garden this week, you're not alone. Yeah, but slow down before you start clearing and planting. I think you know that. It's March 3rd. Meteorologist Angelotti explains why it's not quite time. That first push of late winter warmth turns a cold, weary homeowner's thoughts towards outdoor chores. But hang on, warns Bree Wilson, horticulture coordinator for the Butterfly House in Chesterfield. We have had unusually warm weather, so it feels like it's the time, but still giving it a couple more weeks before you really get your hands in the garden. Not only will cold days likely return, but pollinators in your garden will still need cover during chilly nights. We are kind of looking for uh, temperatures being in the 50s for a full week at least to allow overwintering insects to kind of come out of hiding for the winter. The Butterfly House's native garden is full of plants carefully selected to provide habitat for animals, host plants for caterpillars, and nectar sources for butterflies. Once a few more warm weeks pass, they'll start to wake up the space. 
over the next few weeks, we will start to um, cut back some of the flower spikes that we left up from last year that were providing protection for wildlife and insects and start to um, rake out some of the leaves that are on the crowns of the plants. While it's too early to start digging, now is the time to start preparing for gardening season. If you have a perennial garden, just thinking of holes that you might want to fill or just different new plants that would be exciting for your garden or specific um, pollinators you're trying to attract. If you want to awaken some beauty in your own backyard, then don't miss out on the Butterfly House's pollinator plant sale. You'll find a wide variety of native plants that bees and butterflies love. Online sales kick off March 26th, and they'll have in-person sales April 23rd and 24th. Reporting from Faust Park in Chesterfield, I'm meteorologist Angela Huddy. Nice to see that sunshine today, even though temperatures are more than 30 degrees cooler. That has not affected the allergy numbers, though. They are on the rise under blue skies. Mold spores a little over 500, moderate levels of maple, low levels of willow. Getting to be that time of year, we have some roller coaster temperatures in the weekend forecast. Crib bumpers are sold as a way to protect a baby's head as they sleep, but a local U.S. Senator says they're more dangerous than protective, and she's fighting to ban them. And coming up in sports, the Cardinals ready to hand out another red jacket, but you will get to decide who gets to make that call to the hall. Weather driven by your Gateway Honda dealers. Visit gatewayhondadealers.com. Tell you what, big change in the weather today. Those temperatures some 20 to 30 degrees colder. However, at least the sun was shining. And if we had to do it, you know, following an 80 plus degree day, at least we were still above normal before you averaged it all out this afternoon. And you had these beautiful blue skies. Just a bit of a breeze outside right now as you look live. Some of our Renewal by Anderson web cameras. Nice breeze over at Cahokia Heights. Uh, sunny skies over at Aries Winery and Resort over there. Nice afternoon to be hanging out. Uh, Maybe inside, not so much out on the deck. Latest temperatures down in the 40s over at Aries. You're at 46 in Grafton. Cahokia Heights, 49, 47 at Sparta Community Airport, and 52 at Perryville at the uh, Missouri Veterans 
uh, memorial down there. Look at the huge change in temperatures over the last 24 hours. It is 20, 30 plus degrees colder at this hour versus 24 hours ago. 33 degrees colder here now in St. Louis. It is that northeast wind that's blowing in the cooler temperatures. You range from the 30s in Illinois where it's 34 in Moline, 38 up there in Springfield. We're down to 48, but the warm air is not that far away. It's 74 in Springfield, 79 in Tulsa. That was a cold front, but it's about to turn into a warm front lift north towards St. Louis, and that means our temperatures start to warm up uh, later on tonight and tomorrow. 65 will be your high temperature tomorrow, back almost to 80 degrees across parts of Kansas, 78 in Salina, 71 in Kansas City. Then as we head into Saturday, even warmer weather. Saturday is looking better and better by the minute. Even with more clouds and sun, we're going to warm it up to 76 degrees. But notice the drop out to the west, a cold front making its way into the northern plains Saturday into Sunday. It's going to offer up our next chance for rain and thunderstorms, but not until Saturday evening. So much of the day Saturday, we'll have a lot of this sunshine. We had some golfers out, even though we had the colder temperatures today. We're at 48, and all of a sudden, after highs in the low 80s yesterday, we have a wind chill of 43 degrees thanks to that gusty northeast wind, and the pressure is falling. Today's high, it's deceiving. It was officially 60 degrees, but it was right after midnight. Afternoon highs were in the low 50s, which is actually pretty close to normal. 52 is the normal high. Normal low is 33. The morning low is 41, but I expect we will drop below that before midnight tonight. String of low pressure systems out west. This will become our next round of stormy weather. We'll actually have two rounds of stormy weather. One Saturday evening, early Saturday night. And then another one Sunday, late evening and overnight Sunday night into Monday. Until then, looks like we get to enjoy return to milder temperatures after a cooler weather pattern today and tonight. Here comes the warm front during the late night hours and through the morning hours tomorrow. That will usher in more of a southerly wind. And after a cold start tomorrow, temperatures will start to rebound. We'll hit the 60s tomorrow, 70s on Saturday. But future cast goes into motion. Notice the daylight hours Saturday. So we click through the day dry, but by Saturday evening, as this next front comes in, a couple of narrow lines of showers and thunder showers will bubble up. May even be some severe weather, a level two risk up here in Iowa, northern Illinois, northern Missouri. I don't see any severe weather here, but some rumbles of thunder are possible as we hit uh, Saturday evening. 65 degrees, your high temperature for tomorrow. Tomorrow night, we're down to 52 degrees for the overnight low, and that extended forecast you know what? We're talking about temperatures which will warm back up. 76 on Saturday. Some evening storms likely. Then much of Sunday is dry. Then Sunday night, heavy rain and thunderstorms. And we could be cold enough by Monday to mix in a few snowflakes with that rainfall. Uh, Monday's high, 45 degrees. For the latest highlights and stories, just click sports at fox2now.com. You know, it's, uh, it's a lesson for us. You know, I th you know, I think we're a better team than them. I think we can beat them. And and, you know, we just didn't have the full 60 that we needed to tonight. In baseball, Tony called it the hard nine. In hockey, got to play the full 60. Didn't happen, and the Blues winning streak disappeared. Blues continued that goalie rotation. Huso's turn on Wednesday when a guest at Bennington now plays on Saturday. Blues did a number of things right, namely scoring three goals in a span of two minutes, 14 seconds. Three goals on three straight shots. O'Reilly, Barbashev, and Ferran with those goals. But... Rangers were able to tie it in the third period, and you could just sort of feel the momentum shift. A bad penalty by Colton Pareko put the Rangers on the power play, so it was tied. And when they went on the power play, costly. Chris Kreider hanging in front, gets the deflection. New York took the lead, then added an empty netter. Blues' four-game winning streak is over. They upped their uh, intensity in the third and um, had us on our heels and ended up tying it, and then we took a costly penalty, and they scored, I mean, you know, we played two real good periods. Um, you know, we need to close that out. College basketball, the Illini, two final games of the Big Ten are going to both be at home tonight, 6 o'clock tip against Penn State. Fighting Illini are 13-5 and in the Big Ten, playing to improve their NCAA seating and hoping for a deep March run. That's a part of the reason why I came back, um, you know, to take my team to a Final Four or even further, you know. Um, that's a huge dream for every every college athlete. If you're not dreaming of playing in the Final Four, you need to stop playing basketball, man. You feel me? So right now it's just about finishing out the season strong, you know, and just getting into that postseason mind mindset where it's all or, all or nothing. This is a baseball story, but it's not about the lockout ending. Instead, Cardinals have announced their annual ballot for the team's Hall of Fame. Matt Holiday on there for the first time. 
George Hendrick is also on the ballot for the first time. Matt Morris, two-time All-Star, is on the ballot for the seventh time. Edgar Renteria, Steve Carlton rounding it out. So five former Cardinals on that ballot voting to pick one begins online on Saturday. Then they enshrine them in late August. It's become a popular thing with Cardinal fans to debate it. Were they here long enough? Mark McGuire got in the Cardinal Hall of Fame because of his immense popularity mm -hmm. despite only playing here for a few seasons. So it's interesting to debate. It's interesting to talk baseball of some kind. <laughs> right? exactly. Hopefully by induction in Any late August today? we'll be in the middle of a season. Oh my right? That's a lot I'm, to okay, think about. Exciting. Okay, Martin, thanks. A commercial pilot nearly takes off for his first flight while drunk with a blood alcohol level at four times the legal limit. How he was stopped at the last second and the punishment he could now face. Never miss important news with alerts sent to your phone. Get the Fox 2 Now app. Passengers on a JetBlue flight from Buffalo to Fort Lauderdale shocked and frightened when they found out the reason for a long delay. Their pilot was pulled from the cockpit and arrested for being drunk. Dave Gerber has the disturbing details. It is a remarkable story. 52-year-old pilot James Clifton was in the cockpit getting ready to fly 133 passengers from Buffalo to Fort Lauderdale. It was around 6.15 this morning when NFTA officers pulled him from the plane. TSA agents had suspected that something was off about Clifton when he was checking his gun through security just minutes earlier. There were some questions and some suspicions. That's when we became involved, when the TSA officers called our officers, and that's when we got involved. Gave him a breathalyzer, and, and we know how he did with that. Did not do well. Clifton ended up blowing a .174. That's more than four times the legal limit for pilots. JetBlue ended up firing Clifton and has launched an investigation. So has the FAA. He was taken into custody but not charged. Right now we are working with federal officials and he may face some, some serious charges. The pilot who was taken off of JetBlue today very likely is look at, looking at several years of hard prison time. An NFTA police report says Clifton had gone out the night before to Sidelines Bar on Delaware Avenue. While in the police interview room, Clifton apparently told someone over the phone that he drank 10 22 ounce beers, also known as tall boys. This morning, he missed the shuttle to the airport and had to take an Uber because he was late. A wise move would just simply call in sick. I'm, I'm just not able to fly today. No reason. 
I'm just not feeling well. That's the safe way to do it because the risks are profound. Aviation expert Bob Miller says pilots who have drinking problems can face huge obstacles when trying to get help. It's a real bad situation for the pilot to report to his company that he has a drinking problem. The company will help, but very likely the company has the option of putting him on the ground for at least one full year, in most cases, until they're assured that the pilot has resolved the problem. Now, Clifton is currently suspended while an investigation takes place. And as for the passengers on the plane, Clifton's arrest delayed their trip by four hours. Well, Missouri lawmakers are urging retailers to support Ukraine. How the show me state is causing its own financial strain on Russia as the invasion continues. Bringing out the creativity of what's inside these students' minds, we'll introduce you to the staff and students behind Outside Literary Magazine. For news 24-7, just open our Fox 2 St. Louis app. Welcome back to Fox 2 News at 5. Our top story tonight, St. Charles County officials are investigating after tornado sirens went off by mistake this morning. They say an error caused the sirens to go off, but no word yet on what that error is. The sirens were heard around 10 a.m. in St. Charles County and parts of St. Louis. March is the month when statewide awareness for severe weather is put in the spotlight. Next week has been designated Severe Weather Preparedness Week. Illinois State Police are investigating after a Collinsville police officer killed a man during a reported home invasion. This happened last night around 830 on Arnold Street. Police say 45 year old Kevin Steinhauer was in someone's home armed with a gun. He was ordered to drop the weapon, but instead opened the door and fired at police who returned fire. In other news tonight, a jury has acquitted the former officer charged with endangerment during the raid that ultimately killed Breonna Taylor. Brett Hankinson was the only Louisville police officer charged in the deadly shooting. He testified that he thought his officers were engaged in a shootout with a man firing a semi-automatic rifle, which is why he opened fire. On the other side, prosecutors argued that Hankinson endangered a family next door when his bullets went through their wall. Defense attorneys then argued he was trying to protect his fellow officers. The Louisville Police Department fired him three months after the raid. As the war ramps up in Ukraine, lawmakers in Washington are trying to figure out how to better respond. President Biden met with his cabinet today. His administration is now asking Congress for $10 billion for Ukraine's humanitarian and security needs. The administration says it's given Ukraine $1.4 billion and in since last year, but Ukraine's president Vladimir Zelensky says the U.S. could have done more to prevent the invasion. Bipartisan calls are growing in Congress to ban oil imports from Russia and move toward energy independence. 
Well, state leaders are asking Missouri retailers to remove Russian products from their shelves and cut any ties with Russian governmental entities and businesses. Our Missouri Chief Capital Bureau reporter Emily Manley has more on the steps lawmakers are taking to stand with Ukraine. Emily? Mandy, members of the state retirement system here in the state of Missouri just finished an emergency meeting where they unanimously decided to remove any Russian assets in Missouri's retirement system for employees. That comes as today House members approved a resolution which would ask the president and Congress to impose stronger sanctions against Russia. And vow to support Ukraine hold Russia fully accountable for its catastrophic decision to invade this sovereign nation. One week after Russia invaded Ukraine. Whatever it is to hurt them as much as those hurting our Ukrainian people that we can do through sanctions. The state of Missouri is pledging to stand and support Ukraine. If we were asked tomorrow to do something, I'm sure I would respond to that ask. We're doing everything we can with the resources we have and the laws that we have in the state of Missouri. Thursday morning, the House unanimously approved a resolution urging Biden and the federal government to send supplies to Ukraine and tighten sanctions on Russia. It's difficult for us to watch what's going on TV and comprehend it. You, you, see, you see entire blocks of apartments completely destroyed. Igor Shalai is a Missouri House staffer and from Ukraine. I'm not scared, I'm mad because somebody coming to my house and said, this is not your house. He came to Missouri in 2009. His family still back in his home country. That's why nobody stepped back. People want to fight. Lieutenant Governor Mike Kehoe is asking retailers to remove Russian products from their stores. And substitute them with American made and hopefully Missouri made products. The state treasurer is working to remove any Russian investments from the pension system. We do have a little bit of exposure to Russia in the pension system. Um, it's very common for pension plans to invest in global emerging markets. Now back to that retirement system. As of last week, there were $13 million within that system. But as I told you that the board voted just a little bit ago to get rid of all those assets. Kehoe said that out of all the Russian products that are here in Missouri, most of them are spirits like vodka. There were also, there's also other legislation that has been filed this week that would stop and prohibit any state and local governments from doing any business with Russia or buying Russian products. Reporting live tonight from Missouri State Capitol Bureau in Jefferson City, I'm Emily Manley, Fox 2 News. Well, Boeing is sending $2 million to help the people of Ukraine. $1 million will go to the organization CARE. That's to buy food, water, and hygiene kits. $500,000 of it will go to the American Red Cross. And $250,000 to AmeriCares for medicine and medical supplies. With the other two fifty dollars going to organizations helping displaced Ukrainians. The U.S. Senator for Illinois, Tammy Duckworth, spoke on the Senate floor today to share her support for Ukraine. She is calling on President Biden to grant temporary protected status to Ukrainians in the United States. Senator Duckworth also pledging her support to Ukrainian Americans in Illinois, with the Chicago metropolitan area being home to the second largest population of Ukrainian Americans in the United States. Today, I want to speak to all the Ukrainians who found a home in Illinois and all of them who are strewn across Europe who've been forced to flee their nation in the wake of this violence, and to all who are still in Ukraine, praying that they'll be able to wake up again tomorrow. Let me say this clearly, we are with you. Senator Duckworth is a retired Army National Guard Lieutenant Colonel and a member of the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee. And Senator Duckworth used her time on the floor today to present another piece of legislation to ban crib bumpers. The mother of two says she questioned the padding meant to protect a baby's head after she learned they are a suffocation hazard. 113 babies have died from the bumpers and another 113 babies had non-fatal incidents. The city of Chicago has banned crib bumpers. Some high school students in the St. Louis area are making their voices heard through the written word. Fox 2's Patrick Clark shows us how a collaborative written project is giving a voice to teenagers who've been affected by the pandemic. 
In the Tower Grove East neighborhood, a group of students meeting to exchange the things that have been on their minds. We work around the whole classroom. We have each one of the students in the class will read each other's stories, give them feedback that might help. It's a collaborative process as they put together a literary magazine and bring to life the things they've had inside while stuck indoors. Over the course of a year, they publish one issue online and we do a print issue with Central Print. And um, all year they're working on how to figure out how to, how to publish a magazine, how to market a magazine, how to throw an event. What began at Central Visual and Performing Arts High School and Collegiate School of Medicine and Biosciences has expanded into a literary magazine run entirely by high school teenagers in the St. Louis Public Schools. It started out as a poetry and art club and I wasn't too, I'm not really into poetry myself. I'm into more writing short stories personally, but when I heard about it, um, it was only until this year where they renamed it as a literary magazine and so I was like, that's different, I want in. So they are able to express themselves through written, written word and also through visual expression. And so that is, uh, for some of them, they may be described as introverts if you see them in the hallway, but when you read their poetry and when you see the visual combined with the poetry, you, they're making, a, it is a big, big message. This is the sixth year that Outside Literary Magazine has come to life. I joined this club because I was interested in doing some editing stuff and working on the magazine with a team, especially because uh, all the pandemic, I just needed to, I needed to work on my communication skills or like also building confidence. The next issue is set to be released in April, where you can read how they harness their creativity into a collection of poems, stories, and ideas. In the Tower Grove East neighborhood, Patrick Clark. Fox 2 News. Well, you've probably noticed that gas prices continue to rise and there's no end in sight. Plus $30 for a po' boy sandwich. The struggle for seafood restaurants to either raise the prices or take items off the menu as demand skyrockets during Lent. Inflation and the cost of gas and oil are surging to a new record this month. The national average is $3.73 a gallon, which is up 18 cents from one week ago and a full dollar more from one year ago. In San Francisco, a gallon of gas 
went over the $5 mark today. Oil prices surged another $7 a barrel yesterday, bringing the price to nearly $113 a barrel. That's the highest level since 2014. And the rise is attributed to the ongoing war between Ukraine and Russia. Russia, of course, a major exporter of crude oil, accounting for about 12% of the world's supply. I'm having to pay $5.50 some places. The markets are very nervous about how long will this invasion last? What will the outcome be? Uh, will Russia pull its oil from Europe in response to harsh sanctions from the West? And the spike in oil and gas prices is unlikely to ease anytime soon as the war appears to be intensified. And according to AAA, gas prices in Missouri are some of the lowest in the country while Illinois is in the higher tier of prices. The average cost in Missouri is about $3.40 a gallon. That is, though, up 18 cents from just a week ago. The average price in Illinois is already over $4 a gallon at 402. That's up 31 cents from a week ago. Prices are up all over. Seafood prices are spiking just in time for Lent. Restaurants serving fresh seafood are either raising their prices or taking some items off the menu altogether. Lobster has been reported at $18 a pound in some areas, while oysters and crawfish are becoming hard to find. Even with high prices, seafood restaurants are expecting busy Fridays during the Lenten season. Prices are a little discouraging, but it hasn't stopped us. Just got to tighten our belt a little bit right now, but we're going to be good. You can also find seafood at Fish Fries across the St. Louis region. They kicked off yesterday for Ash Wednesday, and many are open every Friday from now until Easter. The Fish Fry Finder is now live on Fox2Now.com. News Nation offers live balanced news every night in prime time. And here's a preview of what they're working on for tonight. Putin's army could be closer to America than you might think. Why Russian allies are just 90 miles off the coast of Florida, the help they could provide, and the similarities to the Cuban Missile Crisis. Tonight on News Nation Prime, here's Dan Abrams. Thanks. Tonight on Dan Abrams Live on News Nation. Taking out a tyrant. The CIA tried for years to kill Castro and take out oppressive leaders in the past. Some now asking, could Putin be legally assassinated? That's tonight on Dan Abrams Live. And it's all coming up tonight on the fastest growing cable news network in America. It's News Nation. You can see some of the channels right there or just check your local listings. 24 hours ago, I absolutely didn't need the fire or the jacket. Man, have things changed today. A whole lot colder, but it doesn't last. I have a warming trend already in the forecast and some rain, but not a washout of a weekend. We'll time it out for you next.
We had another beautiful day as we take a live look at the Gateway Arch in downtown St. Louis. Yeah, Chris Higgins out on the lakeside renovation and design weather deck with more on the weather we're currently doing, dealing with Chris. You know what, and I, I made a point of this yesterday coming into today, and it certainly rings home now that it's 30 plus degrees colder. Had yesterday not happened, this would be pretty darn nice for the early part of March. Temperatures in the 50s, upper 40s, lots of sunshine. There'd be a lot of smiling faces, but we've had a taste of what it could be and what it will be, and now we want it, a lot of it. We're going to get a bit more of it heading into the weekend, but uh, for now, this evening, you're going to need the jackets and sweaters. It's kind of chilly out here, but a pretty sunrise and sunset. This is Warren County, Innsbruck Resort from Renewal by Anderson, the setting sun over Aspen Lake. A little bit of a breeze out there earlier, but those winds dying off now from the north and northeast. Same kind of view as we look live over Post Dispatch Lake. The time lapse there, watching the setting sun, winds diminishing as we work into the evening. And with the diminishing winds, dry air cools off rapidly, and we are seeing that occur even as we speak. As we look at the Powers Insurance Bureau, the westbound view through West St. Louis, we're already down to 48 degrees. Now, technically, the high today was 60, but that was right after midnight. The daylight working day high temperature was about 52 degrees. Yo-yo temperatures in the extended forecast. After a chill tonight and today, we're going to be back in the 60s tomorrow, back well into the 70s. In fact, Saturday, Saturday looks good. And then it gets bouncy from there in terms of the chances for thunderstorms. Speaking of thunderstorms, it is somewhat unsettled this weekend. But as I mentioned yesterday and the day before, I would not cancel my plans because we may squeeze out perfect timing with this rainfall to make for a decent weekend around the raindrops. And I'll show you why here in a bit. Temperatures, there they are. They're in the 40s now across the entire metro. 44 over in Edwardsville, but 49 in Pacific. That cool northeast wind pushing the front about as far as it's going to go down over the Ozarks. Look at Springfield. No cold air there. They're at 74 degrees. It's 64 down at Poplar Bluff. That front returns back to the north tomorrow as a warm front. We're getting up into the 60s tomorrow, 70s on Saturday. Everything's dry through Saturday afternoon, so let's jump ahead to Saturday evening. This is 11 p.m. Saturday evening into Saturday night. Our next weather front coming in from the northwest. A line of showers and some thunder and lightning with this. Could be some gusty winds, maybe a little small hail. This will swing through Saturday evening. So after 6 or 7 o'clock, watch for storms on Saturday. Before that, Saturday looks great. Heading into Sunday, Sunday morning, Sunday midday, Sunday early to mid-afternoon. A yeah, mix of clouds and sun, a little cooler with highs in the 60s, but there's nothing much showing up around here. It looks like much of Sunday is dry until we get to the evening and then boom, here it comes. Big wall of rain, thunderstorms, heavy rain is likely Sunday night into early Monday morning. And those rainfall totals continue to look pretty impressive. We're going to wash all the salt and the grime off the roads. One to two inch rainfall likely from I-44 and I-70 to the south and east. Most of that will come as we head through Sunday evening and Sunday night. The morning rush will be fine tomorrow, but you will need the heat. Temperatures will be in the 30s with partly cloudy skies, and we'll have a mix of clouds and sun with warmer temperatures tomorrow afternoon. We'll hit 65 degrees. 76 with mainly dry daytime conditions on Saturday, but Saturday evening, Saturday night, watch out for some scattered showers and thunderstorms. Much of Sunday is dry. We watch Sunday night for rain and thunderstorms, then much colder again Monday. Some scattered showers, maybe even mixing with some wet flakes of snow north of Interstate 70 Monday afternoon. Temperatures falling into the 30s and then cool weather Tuesday and Wednesday. Warm it up to near 60 though again by Thursday. So roller coaster temperatures. Welcome mm -hmm. to spring. Oh yeah. yeah. St. Louis. Thank <laughs> yep. you, Chris. Ukrainian families are fleeing the country with pets that are hungry and nearly frozen. The animal rescue that's meeting them at the border with much needed supplies and some help with their travels.
Now to our picture of the day. This was sent to us by Micah in St. Louis, who captured this squirrel enjoying a few almonds on her front patio. We want to see your pictures. You can upload them to our website, fox2now.com. Include your name and where that photo was taken. An animal rescue group in Romania is coming to the rescue of Ukrainian pets who are fleeing war with their families. Nearly a million Ukrainians have been estimated to have fled the country already, and many of them have their beloved pets with them. The organization Animal Welfare Assistance is coming to their aid at the border the best they can with food, water, blankets, and a veterinary ambulance offering vaccines and medication. Now, they're also helping families make sure that all of their travel documents are in order so they can stay in Romania or even travel on to other European countries. Good for them to be there now. There's so many things to consider when these refugees have left their homes and taking their pets with them. They're facing a lot. Well, we thank you for joining us for Fox 2 News at 5. And Fox 2 News at 6 is next. you can count on. This is Fox 2 News at 6. North St. Louis County residents and people across our viewing area still hearing that strange hum. Contact 2 continues its investigation. This former Arnold police officer spent 46 days in the hospital. But tonight we have great news to share about Ryan O'Connor. From Ferguson to Clayton, how a North County resident is now serving the entire St. Louis County region. His first project, a survey to allow residents to decide how to spend federal funds. Also new at 6, see how the baseball lockout has stadium workers sitting on the sidelines. Thank you for joining us for Fox 2 News at 6. I'm Jasmine Huda. And I'm Shirley Washington. First on Fox, we're learning more about a strange noise North St. Louis County residents say they are hearing. This is a hum that Contact 2's Mike Colombo has heard a lot about. And as he reports tonight, many of you have thoughts on what that sound could be. Since our report on February 21st, we've received dozens of phone calls and emails from people on both sides of the river who say they hear this hum. 
There is still no definitive answer on what's causing it, but we've discovered some new leads and closed the door, at least for now, on some other theories. Listen very closely. The low rumble sounds like a generator running in the distance. It's now morning at the same home in the Castle Ray neighborhood of North St. Louis County. Beyond the birds chirping, you can hear the same hum in the background. The viewer who shared this video with us lives less than three miles northwest of Micah Mayfield's home on Old Jamestown Road. So low that it's almost inaudible, uh, but super consistent. So usually in the evenings after eight, you'd hear, you'd hear a very low humming noise that would come in kind of a wave pattern. And I remember asking my husband, I say, babe, do you hear that noise? And he's like, what noise? And I say, listen. St. Louis County Councilwoman Shalonda Webb can hear the hum from her North St. Louis County home. She's still got the county looking into it, and so are we. Nearby, you'll find Ameren's Portage de Sioux site and Aspire STL Pipeline Storage Facility. Both utilities investigated and say it's not them. Same for the Corps of Engineers and Lambert Airport. Central Stone Company quarry told St. Louis County it's not doing anything during the hours that people report hearing the hum. Once we know what it is, we want to communicate so we can again put minds to ease. And then uh, if it's something that needs to be addressed, that we get a plan and we address whatever the cause of it is. Since I'm not sure what it is, it's hard, hard to guess what they could do. But, um, you know, if there's a way to, to, you know, maybe keep that noise back from the residential areas, that would be great. Viewers have suggested we investigate everything from barge traffic to grain bins, an industrial gas company in Madison County, Illinois, and the Taos Hum. Google it. We appreciate the tips and ask you to keep them coming as we keep trying to find the source of this nuisance noise. I'm Mike Colombo, Fox 2 News. Another sound, tornado warning sirens going off in St. Charles County with no storms in sight. Fox 2 meteorologist Jamie Travers explains what happened. The siren sounded around 950 this morning in St. Charles County. Captain Chris Hunt, the director of emergency management for St. Charles County, said that they were conducting a training exercise and part of that training was to silent test the outdoor warning siren system. Unfortunately, we made a mistake and the system read a button that we pushed and uh, sent an audible signal uh, out to the public as opposed to a silent signal back to us. So the result of that was that uh, the sirens went off in St. Charles County. They conduct an audible test once a month, but they also do a silent test weekly. The mistake left them fielding a lot of calls from concerned citizens. Intentions in the world are pretty high. I think people were not expecting the sirens to go off. I know they were expecting the sirens to go off. We typically put out a message on our social media on test days uh, to remind folks that it's just a test. We didn't do that today and it caught people off guard. Okay. Captain Hunt says they spend a lot of time educating their residents on the importance of these warning sirens and he wants the public to know they are still reliable. It's something that we feel is very important and when these things happen, it's unfortunate, it's a mistake that happened. Uh, but I want to encourage people, you can still trust the warning siren system. Uh, when unfavorable weather conditions are moving into the county, we're monitoring weather and folks need to adhere to the sirens when they're activated. This is a rare occurrence. Uh, it doesn't happen very often. You read articles from around the country and sometimes it does happen. Just unfortunately it happened here today in St. Charles County. As a reminder, the sirens are tested the first Monday of each month. In St. Charles County, the sirens run full strength for three minutes to make sure amplifiers and batteries maintain proper power through the full cycle. Today, those sirens sounded less than a minute. Reporting in O'Fallon, meteorologist Jamie Travers, Fox 2 News. A home invasion suspect is dead after an officer involved shooting in Collinsville involving a Collinsville police officer. It happened last night just after 830 on Arnold Street. Illinois State Police say 45 year old Kevin Steinauer was found inside a home by police and was told to drop his firearm. The East Carondelet man reportedly opened a door and fired at officers. Officers fired back killing Steinauer. No officers were hurt. A hard fought battle with COVID is over for a former Arnold police officer. Ryan O'Connor is now back home with his family after spending 46 days in the hospital for COVID and double pneumonia. 
The 48-year-old husband and father was unable to breathe on his own. His illness was especially challenging due to complications from a traumatic brain injury. O'Connor was shot in the line of duty in 2017. He is now at home, only requiring minimal oxygen for the time being. Well, the Baldwin community and police department are mourning the loss of an officer who died suddenly at home. His co-workers say Officer Steve Morrison was as kind and humble as they come. Fox News' Kelly Hoskins is live with how Officer Morrison is being remembered. Kelly. Well, Shirley and Jasmine, Officer Steve Morrison's police cruiser is parked outside of the Baldwin Police Department, is draped in black bunting as officers continue to grieve his death. They say that he was an officer that had a heart of gold and a pillar in the community. On Thursday, black bunting was draped over the Baldwin Police Department to honor Officer Steve Morrison. Sergeant Rob Rogers says he had the pleasure of having Officer Morrison as his field training officer and says he will be missed. What I got from him was the ability to communicate with people um, no matter what the situation involved. He had a really, really a good knack for being able to speak to people. Officer Morrison's police cruiser that he was assigned to drive sits in front of the police department as a reminder of an officer who dedicated his life to protect and serve. He passed away at his home on his day off and dedicated the last 35 years of his life to service in the Baldwin community. The officer known for having a great sense of humor wore a lot of hats at the department. He was a dare officer visiting a lot of elementary schools, a bike patrol officer, and assisted with community affairs dealing with neighborhood policing. Steve had an incredible sense of humor. Um, and with him training, field training, so many officers that he did throughout his career, that legacy has been passed on to officers like myself. With flags at half staff, officers say hearts are very heavy about losing someone who gave so much to the community. It hit us hard. As uh, a police officer, we deal with tragedy a lot, but it really hits home when it's one of our own. We'll rally together and, and we'll move forward from this too. Now, funeral arrangements are still pending for Officer Morrison and his colleagues say that they're just proud to know that he had a big impact on the community. Reporting live from Baldwin, Kelly Hoskins, Fox 2 News. A man who left North County to work in government across the U.S. is back home, and he says he's ready to give his St. Louis County neighbors a voice in how to recover from the pandemic. Fox News' Kim Hudson has this exclusive report on New at 6. I believe this was a junior prom at CBC. A child raised by the entire community. This is my godmother. Made his family proud when he moved away. He loves my, my candy sweet potatoes. Oh my gosh. And he, tra <laughs> and he tried to fix them in D.C. He tried. Calvin Harris II grew up in Ferguson to community activist parents. And he's back home wanting to make that community proud. I believe we have an obligation to, um, you know, really uh, give folks a lot of faith and give people a lot of hope uh, simply through the way we govern. That dream, with a few pit stops along the way, took him from being a resident of North County to a servant of the entire St. Louis County region. I'm chief of staff for uh, County Executive Sam Page. Page appointed Harris in January. Harris immediately gathered an ethnically diverse team, and in February, they launched an online survey. Residents now have a say in how $80 million in American Rescue Plan Act funds will be spent. As we sort of issue these funds, uh, we kind of want to hear from the people themselves, you know, uh, on, you know, ways they think we should really uh, kind of boost recovery efforts in St. Louis County. But Harris admits not everyone has access to the technology to complete this survey. So the county will have several town halls where staff will help those residents. We're not stopping there. Uh, we're already uh, starting the process of reach out to, you know, black fraternities and sororities, uh, various, uh, you know, community and civic based organizations uh, and, you know, just having conversations with as many people as we can. So what does his hometown think of all this? He's just always had a vision, and I believe confidently that he'll make it happen. In St. Louis County, Kim Hudson, Fox 2 News.